Um, shall we make a start then, everybody? It's right on six o'clock. Oh, okay. Right. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our latest uh, campaign call, Zero Cobalt's latest campaign call. <clears throat> My name is Frank, Frank McIntaggart, member of the um, steering committee. Uh, should be a very, very interesting meeting tonight um, on the state of our health service and what we can do about it. We have two speakers, um, Tony O'Sullivan, who's co-chair of Keep Our NHS Public, um, a retired uh, paediatrician, and also uh, Noah Behrman, who's a member of the um, uh, steering committee, um, COVID Action Steering Committee. And uh, Noah's going to talk about his experience as an American of the US health system and also um, as, as, as a resident in, in uh, the Netherlands of the uh, Dutch uh, health system as well. Um, so the speakers will speak for about 15 minutes each um, and then uh, we'll throw it open to uh, discussions and questions. Somebody else will be taking over at the chair at seven o'clock because I've got to go to another meeting. Uh, because they're trying to close a local hospital up here in Merseyside, so let's go on about that. Um, and uh, we'll probably finish around about half seven, uh, thereabouts, uh, I suppose. Now, I don't know who we hadn't decided who's going to go first to speak. Um, Tony, do you want to go first? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'll let, let you decide that whether you want to hear the personal experience first or the, or the. I don't know. I, mean, I, I, I perhaps maybe talk about the general first yourself, and then Noah can talk about okay his experience of the American system, etc. Okay, over to you then, Tony. Cheers. All right. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. And I know COVID Action is one of the sponsors of SOS NHS, um, and, and we organised the march on Saturday. So good to see you all. Um, I, I was asked by Sue. Thank you, Sue, to, to talk about NHS privatisation. And I thought I'd try to discuss a bit more about what privatisation is and what it means ra rather than just rattle off a load of, of statistics, um, which you probably many of you know already. But uh, one of the questions is, can, can a private system provide good health care? And I, I, the answer is, for some, sure it can. If you're in America, you, know, you can have the best health service in the world if, if you're rich enough to pay for it. But for everyone... Certainly, it may, may be in, in some respects, but it'll be very expensive and it will have an inbuilt inequality. Um, can, the, can the private sector ever provide universal health care? Well, not if it wants to make any profits, so the answer is, is no. Uh, the variation of that in, in Europe, which is touted by the, um, the um, Institute of Economic Affairs all the time, can the, insurance, the social insurance model provide universal health care? Well, Yes, you can provide healthcare under under a private system, but it will be more expensive and or unequal, and will include upfront charges to disincentivize people to disincentivize people from using it, and um, there will be incentives for the for the, the participants in that the insurance companies and the and, and some of the doctors to make profits out of it. Switzerland is always portrayed by the IEA as the, the best uh, cancer service in the world, for example, but it literally spends close to double per capita on healthcare compared to Britain. So uh, the, these are slightly old figures. In 2016, the OECD figures were that the UK spent just over $4,000 per head per year on health. It's the US spent two and a half times that at $10,000 and Switzerland nearly doubled, just under $8,000 per year per, per person. France and Germany, I wouldn't go around saying the, the, the health systems in these countries are bad because they're not, um, but they are very different. And if we were funded at the same level of France, we would be getting 40 billion pounds a year more. And in Germany, if it were equivalent on their spending per capita, 70 billion pounds a year more in this country on the health service. And that is why you have the uh, hospital ceilings falling down and 133,000 vacancies, et cetera, et cetera. 
the, the NHS has been under attack ever since its inception. And so how has it been undermined as a publicly provided service? You can undermine any public service, including the NHS, simply by underfunding it. And you don't even have to have privatisation to do that. You just squeeze it until it starts to crack. The cracks appear and it starts to fail. But on the other hand, on, al alongside that, if you have an ideology that says we want to return it to the private sector, you make the public service start to fail and, and then you promote the private service as its saviour. But you also have the waiting list pressure for people to, uh, to make their own individual decisions to go privately. Um, I, I can hear some feedback. I don't know if any, everybody else can, but um, I'll, I'll carry on anyway. And the other way of doing it is very deliberately breaking up the founding principles of, of the NHS. Uh, we used to have universal access. That's no longer the case because over a million migrants are unable to access hospital care. It used to be free at the point of use, but now you know, for, for decades, people have to pay for dentistry, have to pay nine pounds plus for a prescription. We have to pay for vision. We even have to pay for earwax removal these, these days in many areas. So you can undermine the NHS in this double pronged attack of underfunding and, and having the private sector sitting in there in the wings. I wanted to just tackle the question, is the NHS being sold off? Because literally as, as those words are used, the government at the moment just simply dismisses it. They say nothing is being sold off. So let's discuss that a little bit more. In one sense, the NHS being sold off is inaccurate. The, the government or the, um, or the NHS is in fact paying the private sector rather than the private sector paying for chunks of the NHS. So we're, the, the private sector is being, is being paid for providing sections of health or other services to the NHS. NHS. So it's not like the British gas sell-off, you know, the Tel Sid campaign, where shares in gas, in gas were being sold off to the public. But it's every bit as insidious. And, and does it matter about whether you were saying that? Well, for me, it matters simply that the government dismisses it regularly and out of hand. Nothing is being sold off. So we just have to get our lines right to, to, to know what we're doing. There are examples that, of course, are, are, are pretty damn cl close to that. The ownership of uh, hospitals built by PFI, uh, the ownership is in the hands of the private companies. The Treasury uh, didn't, didn't get money for those hospitals, but they didn't borrow money from the from the public from the um, in order to create those hospitals. And instead, they are repaying pay, PFA. PFI payments to those PFI companies sevenfold over and above the original investment. And uh, another good example is the corporate company from the US Centene and their UK operative Operos. Now they certainly paid out money to buy out 80 medics and they are now the biggest provider of primary health care in this country. And they're a profit taking multinational corporation um, as opposed to the, albeit self-employed, the vast majority of NHS GPs regard themselves as GP, uh, as NHS employees, and they, they take an NHS pension and they're committed to the NHS. But there's a, the, there's that danger of privatisation in in primary care. So contracts contracting has been the way of bringing the private sector into the NHS, and and it's just technically different from being sold off. And the government can deny that but and we just need to be aware of that in in our arguments uh, whether it's in the press or the media or talking to our neighbors or whatever it, it is now contracts of course can be ended uh, and uh, the the protection of the right to end contracts is, is actually part of the fight against trade deals um, but that is a campaigning aim and a tool to stop new services being co contracted out to the private sector and to fight to win back services back into the public sphere and, and, and that's an important thing for campaigns um but the bigger question i want to also touch on is what is privatization it's not only where you have to pay a transaction fee for healthcare uh, as opposed to 
the shared risk of the NHS, democratically funded NHS paid for from public funds, mainly from progressive taxation. Privatisation also includes the financialization of the NHS, of healthcare itself, or as the system that supports it. And each section of the process, each step of the way, it has been costed through the for the internal market in the NHS and then the external market turned into a transaction contracted for and then you you have the basis for profits being taken the world health organization had a definition of privatization uh, for, and it goes back to 1995 but it's relevant and they de define privatization as a process in which non-government actors become, i.e. private companies or indeed the charitable sector, become increasingly involved in the financing and or provision of healthcare services. Now, that's a much wider uh, definition than simply you have to pay for your healthcare. So the first example there is outsourcing of contracts. Approximately 7% of clinical contracts are currently in the in private contracts hands. That's about 12, 12 billion pounds a year. In 2018-19, there's very good research by the CHPI, and they said that on top of that 7%, it was a bit more then, but 7% now, 18%, uh, including that 7% of NHS funding goes to private companies in many different ways. And that includes the funding of private hospitals for seeing NHS waiting list patients in the private sector. And that's absolutely part of privatization. That is not some great uh, waiting list initiative that I'm afraid Wes Streeting has been supporting. It's actually part of privatization itself. And now if you include GPs, pharmacies, ophthalmic optician services, then the, the chunk of NHS funding that goes that you could say is going to private hands is 26%. I would challenge calling GPs private profiteers in a way because then the, most of them are not profit taking. Most of them are actually NHS in, um, in their heart and soul of their NHS. But but, but uh, so those are figures that are worth knowing about. If you exclude primary care and and uh, community services, it's 18% is is. Uh, is already privatized. But if you look at uh, Opro Centene taking over, you know, th over 300,000 patients in primary care, you can see that some of that 26% is legitimately regarded as profit taking uh, sections of NHS services. Ancillary services, soft services, they're sometimes called, has, have been privatized for, for, for decades now, um, either individually, you know, a, a, a trust privatizing their catering service or as a block contract within a, a PFI contract where, where not only is the building uh, owned by the PFI but the soft services have been contracted so they're very expensive for the hospitals that have those. Clinical support services are also out outsourced as, as we know pathology, specialist imaging, hospital pharmacy, uh, vision services, hearing aids, earwax removal. In my local area in southeast London, they have given the contract for pathology to a private company in partnership with Guy's, Thomas's and King's. And the, the, the value of that contract, which is now in the private sector, is two and a quarter billion pounds over 15 years. So that's a huge chunk of the NHS funding uh, that, that goes in outsourcing contracts. And there's tens of thousands of, of uh, erstwhile NHS employed people now working for the NHS, but actually employed by private sector. The, the, the second huge thing I've touched on already is, is outsourcing of NHS waiting lists. There's a gross waste of money paying private sector, uh, private hospitals. For example, during year one of COVID, 8,000 private beds were paid for by the government, 300 pounds per bed per day, and that they underwrote all the financial risk of the private sector during COVID, ending up with the private sector doing less elective work for the NHS than they'd done pre-COVID, and virtually no COVID work at all, no, no primary COVID work at all. And then they extended that contract for four more years to a, a more select group of hospitals and other services, £10 billion over four years. 
uh, including things like providing cataract sur surgery now routinely. So there's more hip surgery for NHS patients now being done in private hospitals than NHS patients having hip operations in NHS hospitals. And more and more commonly, cataracts are actually routinely done in the private sector for on NHS patients. The other impacts of privatisation, I need to go a bit quicker probably, uh, but personal choice where people can, they choose to go privately because of 7.3 people million people on the waiting list so those that can afford it can jump the waiting list and often see the, the same NHS consultant but in the private clinic down the road and another aspect is NHS staff who have been trained in the NHS trained by the NHS working in the private sector some of those are loyal but demoralized NHS staff that have been poached by private companies to do extra sessions and some of them are less loyal, money-grabbing elements, including uh, consultants, some consultants al al along um, it, within that who are in partnership with the private sector. And for example, by um, e equipment that's used in operating theatres or in investigations, and they're, they're, they um, are in a, a, a joint ownership of, of equipment with the private sector. Another aspect is rationing of NHS treatments, taking them, uh, either rationing them, restricting them, to, uh, or taking them out completely from NHS care. And then people have no choice but to go to the private sector to get those treatments if they need them, or to NHS hospitals offering those treatments uh, for, for, for payment. So there's a, another aspect of privatising what was NHS routine care. Privatisation of the NHS estate, I've already mentioned, PFI contracts of hospitals, but the, more recently, private bills of, for example, health centres and then renting them to the NHS at market rates, which are cripplingly expensive. And then uh, coming to the end of this list, there's the financialization of other aspects of, of NHS services, such as, and hugely important, data. So... Uh, the, the the selling of contracts to the, the latest villain is Palantir, who I'm sure you're, you're you, you've heard of, but they they are going they are likely to get an absolutely massive contract for controlling, running, and uh, and uh, analysing NHS data, including personal health data, public health data, um, patient flow data. And under COVID, that they tried to give the green light to a, a massive expansion of use of data in the by the private sector, but that was challenged successfully to start off with by Foxglove Legal and the Good Law Project. There's there's other financializations of, of what were NHS um, services like estates, um, uh, finance, HR, commissioning processes itself patient access, clinical pathway referral. So all of these ways are turning processes of the NHS into money-making uh, little bits that, be can, can, that can be contracted for. What's likely to happen next? Well, I think this is where it, it, we, it, it may not be the case that the end game is health insurance running the NHS. It may be, but it may not be, because the status quo suits the private sector very well, thank you, for, at the moment in, in the UK. The NHS is immensely popular with, with the, with the uh, population, so an, an overt assault to turn it into an insurance service lock, stock and barrel will be extremely unpopular and may take a lot longer than the Tories uh, are hoping for. But what they do is they, they, they have no training costs whatsoever, minimum risks, so they get a supply of staff. The NHS bails them out for emergencies. Millions and millions of pounds are spent by the NHS on bailing out emergencies generated by uh, a private hospital treatment. 30% of income pre-COVID by for, uh, income for private hospitals was from NHS patients on NHS waiting lists being seen and paid for uh, by the NHS in private hospitals. 50% of patient numbers seen in the private sector were actually NHS patients. And that's another aspect of privatization, as I've said. Waiting lists themselves encourage self-pay, people needing to uh, because, uh, be, because they're in pain or in danger or just because of personal choice and they can. 
and there's the 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 likelihood that more people will take out health insurance uh, on a per permanent basis that actually hasn't exploded yet because you know the cost of living is so severe that uh, uh, most people don't have that kind of spare money and of course the other benefit of the status quo is that the government can very easily deny that the nhs is being sold off and, the, and for them it's a win-win so what to do about it well first of all i would urge you if you're not a member of keeper anxious public please be a member and when i say be a member i don't mean like us on facebook or or follow us on twitter i mean be a member join us uh, join a group pay a, a, a small national subscription that's it's only 25 pounds or less if you're unemployed work locally to challenge new private contracting and to end existing contracts that i've said help us generate the information that can help inform the general public you know it's a permanent state of, of affairs now that we need to counter the government narrative and we may have to carry on that battle if and when there's a, a, a new government and if and when that's the Labour government we may still unfortunately have to be uh, informing the general public that they have to be fighting against privatization and we keep ourselves informed, and you could be involved if you're interested, it, for example, in, in work groups within Keeper NHS Public. We have an integrated care systems work group working on how the, how the integrated care boards work in each area. We have a primary care work group, data and digitalization work group, a mental health work group, and a work group not so active at the moment uh, as needs don't demand that on trade deals. So those are the, some of the areas that we work in that you'd be you'd be very welcome to join. And uh, I'm going to finish there. And I'm sorry I've gone on too long. Or uh, if I've gone too long. <laughs> not at all, Tony, not at all. That was that was excellent. I didn't want to stop you because there was lots of very, very useful and very interesting information there. OK, um, so over to you then, Noah, our, our next speaker who's going to talk about the personal experience of living in a system uh, like the United States um, uh, and, and also the system um, in the Netherlands as well. So over to you, Noah. Uh, yes, hello, everybody. Let me do this real quick. A keynote, a share. All right. Can you all see the thing? It says worse than you think. Great. OK, so uh, yeah, hello, uh, I'm Noah. I'm I do various things. I'm on the COVID Action Steering Committee. I also help out with the COVID Pledge. Um, in my day job, I do um, uh, information security. So I spend a lot of time thinking about risk uh, and about systems. Um, so I am here today to chat with you about, you know, I think something I've heard on previous calls is that there's a sort of a mis, uh, there can be a misunderstanding or a lack of information about what exactly and how exactly the healthcare system in the US works. Um, I've also lived in the Netherlands before I moved to the UK, so uh, for work. So um, I can talk a little bit about them as well, because they have also a private insurance system um, that many people think is not a private insurance system. Okay, so uh, join me on a little, a little journey through time. So anybody remember 2007? Uh, you know, it was, I don't know. It's before the Great Collapse. Uh, skins had just started airing uh, in the UK, set in Bristol, uh, which is where I live. Um, now, does anyone remember 2011? I imagine probably not. Um, this was the American Skins remake, um, and and they they reshot this British show that was extremely British uh, in uh, the US, and it flopped immediately. Um, and I had this is relevant, I promise. And I have a theory for why this happened. Um, I think it was completely unbelievable. So there were two big problems. One problem was that it was shot uh, in Toronto and set in Baltimore, unlike the one here, which was set in Bristol and shot in Bristol. The other thing is, is that there's no NHS in the US. So everything the kids were doing, and they just they just copied the same storyline, the same plot. So these kids are out you know, getting into all kinds of scrapes uh, and shenanigans and doing dangerous things. And everything they do would have completely bankrupted their parents, even in the best case scenario. Um, and I think people were just watching it and they were thinking, you know, this doesn't seem, I, I, I can't relate to this. I can't watch this. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, not that kids are out there thinking, oh yeah, just gonna run up a big health insurance bill, but 
uh, I think there's a, you know, if you look at shows now, um, there's one called Euphoria that is that is set in the U.S. and you know it has people having trouble with insurance and going into hospitals after doing dangerous things and um, you can kind of see the the big difference. Um, so how does healthcare work in the U.S.? Um, we don't really have time to take guesses, so I'll just show you a chart. Uh, so this, this, and, and don't worry, we're going to go through this. You don't have to remember all of this. I'm not just going to make you stare at this horrible thing for, for 10 minutes. Um, but so this is basically how, how health insurance and healthcare. So if you, if you are sick, if you need any kind of healthcare whatsoever, this is the system you're dealing with. All right. And what we're mostly going to focus on is the private financing side, because the public financing side is complicatedly interlinked, as you can see, with all these arrows going every which way, um, with the private system. Um, so pri privately insured individuals, which is basically everyone for most of their lives, um, have to pay for health insurance. Um, so you can get it. There are, there are mitigating factors, right? So you can have it go through um, your employer. You can have, which I'll talk about in a sec. You never go through a marketplace, um, which is not very cool. Uh, and there's also weird, like state-based things. Some some states are lucky, uh, and they have like a statewide care system. Um, not everyone does. And so what happens then is that you're you're so and you can also just and that's what this line is. So you can also just pay direct, right? So you just I need insurance, I pay the full rate. And we'll talk about what that costs on the next slide. But so basically what happens is that most people get health insurance through their employer, um, which is dangerous as we'll go over in a minute. Uh, and then they pay for private insurance. And then the private insurance um, sometimes will pay for providers, will pay for pharmacy uh, stuff, will pay for basically anything you need um, sometimes and only at a certain limit. So let's talk about costs. So uh, the average cost out of pocket. So if you have no benefits, if the state isn't helping, if the your uh, employer doesn't provide health insurance, say you work in a um, you know family cafe um, as I did for for quite some time, um, not my family, but just like a small you know local cafe. Uh, I didn't pay five hundred eighty three for a reason I will talk about in a minute, but the average cost out of pocket is about $583 a month. Um, and that's for an individual, for families. And if you have children, that can skyrocket. It can also be less, don't get me wrong. Um, but uh, that's the average. Now, you might be thinking to yourselves, oh, well, okay. But, you know, I pay that much and I get instant access to care and I get, um, you know, free medicine and I get, no. Uh, you have to pay copays. So um, this is just like a fee you pay to a doctor to go to a doctor. Uh, it's usually be about, my, so my GP in the US, uh, most recently before I left the US, it was $25 per appointment. You'd go in and sit down and the billing people would say, hey, uh, you know, how you doing? I'd be like, well, I'm, you know, here to see the doctor. So I'm not great. Um, and then they'd, uh, they'd take uh, 25 bucks from you. Uh, therapy can be more expensive, so like $75 an appointment, um, and, and this can scale. So I was lucky I had a, anyway, I'll, I won't go into that, but I had a, um, you know, it can vary per visit, it can vary per purpose. Then you have a deductible, and the deductible is the amount you have to spend before insurance kicks in. Um, this can be uh, quite large, this can be quite small, this can be in the thousands of dollars, this can be in the hundreds of dollars. Um, but it means you and and your copay usually does not count as part of your deductible. Um, it depends on the kind of doctor you go see. So, you know, you're you're if you have a lot of health needs, you can often run up huge bills before your insurance even bothers to help out, right? Um, and then that's the question of does it bother to help out? So um, I did not encounter this growing up, but uh, I was very lucky. But I know people who have. Um, and there are amounts you might have to pay if your insurance decides it won't cover a procedure for whatever reason. It says, oh, you don't actually need that life-saving care. Why don't you just, you know, go work out or something like that? 
Um, and they won't even pay for the gym membership, right? So, um, yeah, so that can run very expensive. Um, and, and, you know, that's like life-threatening costs, right? So what systems are there to help? Um, and you don't have to read all of this because this is sort of, I'm trying to prove a point, but uh, I will upload this slide deck somewhere um, so you can see it. But so what can help? So your job could pay for your insurance. Um, they'll usually have a cheaper group plan. Um, I think uh, when I worked at Starbucks, I think it was $17 a month and you got kind of like, okay, health insurance. It wouldn't cover lots of things. And, but you know, it was better than not having it. Um, and it was cheap, but I'm sure you can see the obvious problem, which is it then ties your health and your health insurance to your job. So, you know, I know many people who are afraid to leave jobs that are not treating them well, or that, uh, you know, they, they should have left years ago, but they need health insurance for themselves, they need it for their kids, um, and they're trapped, right? So it's really good if you run a business, really bad if you don't. Um, some jobs will pay for all of it. Some jobs will pay for some of it. Um, it really depends on the job. If you're 26 and under, uh, you can stay on your parents' plan, provided, of course, they have one, provided you have parents, uh, and provided they can pay for it, right? So there's like additional uh, gates you have to hop through. Uh, the the Democrats who are useless on this, uh, they really love these health savings accounts. It's like, okay, you can put some money aside. Um, and it's not taxed if you put it there and you can use it for health things. But of course, again, that means you have that money, right? You have savings you can put aside, um, which most people don't. You join the military if you want. Um, then you can use the Veterans Health Administration uh, or TRICARE, which is there like while you're in. Um, if you are significantly disabled or poor to a certain degree, uh, or you live in the right state, you can use Medicaid, which is a, a state provided health uh, system. Um, there are so many caveats or gotchas, you know, there's, there's, if you're on like disability benefits, um, and then you take Medicaid, sometimes you have to change the benefits you get, but then that can change your eligibility for Medicaid. And then like, if you, you know, have the temerity to have a family, then that also, right. So it's this very like, you know, um, I'll link you to some articles later, uh, about how just pernicious and evil that is. Um, uh, there's, uh, another fun thing that I can link you to, which is if you have Medicaid, your the state can actually, uh, take your house, uh, to pay for it. It's a very strange system. Um, you know, one, one thing that people often say about, should we have socialized healthcare is, uh, you know, should we have, you know, free the point of service healthcare is, oh, but you know, you're not going to get to live in your house. You're going to have to go live in a, in a, you know, big apartment block. Well, you're not going to get to do that anyway under, you know, for-profit healthcare. So sorry about that. Um, if you're significantly disabled and or elderly, there's also a program called Medicare, but like Medicaid, there's about a million caveats to that too. So you have to have lived in the U.S. for a certain number of years or be a citizen and have paid taxes or be able to pay for it or live in a state where you qualify, or have a sympathetic caseworker, or the right kind of disability, or anyway, and it just goes on and on and on and on, right? Um, yeah, so it's not it's not ideal. You know, there are many systems set up in theory to make things better for you, but in practice, um, you're taking your life in your hands. I was lucky, I was privileged. Um, my parents had health insurance through their work, um, so I was on it until I was 26. Uh, and then unrelated, for unrelated reasons, I then left the United States. Um, but, you know, I still had to pay co-pays. I still had to pay for prescriptions. Um, yeah, it was not free at the point of service. Still had to hand over my health insurance card to get anything. Um, my dentistry insurance card, my, yeah, anything. You just hand over something and they say, great. Now, so I did leave the U.S., right? And I moved to the Netherlands. Um just put this thing I saw this morning here because it's funny and I thought we needed a little bit of a little bit of a break. <laughs> um, so the Dutch, right? I mean, you know, they have a, so I, so I lived in the Netherlands for four years and and one thing about the, the Netherlands is they have kind of a field, like a reality distortion field 
um, where where people just assume they're just everything is great there. Um, but they have a private health insurance system. Um, it's it's all for profit. Uh, so you know if you're cycling along and you fall into this cycle path, um, you know you 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 sort of have a thing. Um, the problem is is that with any for profit system, there's perverse incentives, right? So mostly all of my experiences with, with the Dutch medical profession is a recommendation to take paracetamol. Um, people say that as a joke sometimes when you talk about it, but it is really true. Like I would go in and I would say, hey, you know, doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this. And they'd say, well, have you taken paracetamol about it? And I'd say, well, no. And they'd say, okay, we'll do that. So basically if you're not, you know, if your arm isn't like in the process of falling off, don't bother. They don't care. Um, it's 110 euros a month, so it's cheaper. That's true. It is cheaper. Uh, most workplaces don't pay for it, uh, mm -hmm. and you can get benefits if you're if you can afford that, or you can take on a higher deductible, what they call own risk, which is very cute because, as I'm sure we all know, healthcare is not an individual problem. It's a it's a society wide problem, and so it's not your own risk. It's everyone's risk you're taking on. Um, but the purpose of the system is to drive down cost of healthcare. So they they make it very difficult to get anything at all, right? Um, you know, you go in and you say, I, I know what I need. I need you know, I'm used to the American system where you basically go in and you say, look, I, I know exactly what I need. Can you make this happen for me? And if you're lucky, they say yes. The Dutch system, you go and you say, look, I know what you need. And they say, yeah, sure. Have you tried paracetamol? Um, yeah. So we're all here because this is COVID action, right? Um, and and I, I hope, or because we're interested, or I don't know, because we have nothing else to do on a Monday night. Um, and so how, how does this tie in with uh, COVID, right? Is what's, what's the connection here? Why is this relevant? Well, on the 11th of May, 2023, that's coming up, uh, the President of the United States will end COVID's designation as a public health emergency. Um, obviously, if we're here, we know that that's incorrect. Um, it remains a public health emergency uh, in the UK, in the US, and the Netherlands. Um, you know, case rates continue to, the, the plateau continues to rise, you know. Um, so what does this mean, right? So it means that uh, as of May 11th, uh, vaccines and treatments like Paxlovid uh, will be controlled by insurance only. So if your insurance decides it's not worth you getting a round of Paxlovid, uh, too bad, so sad. Um, testing as well. Um, on April 1st, a program called Medicaid expansion, or a, so you don't need to worry about the technical bits of it, but there's a thing called Medicaid expansion where some states, not all states, uh, will let people who are slightly less poor get on Medicaid. Um, and under COVID, uh, the public emergency for COVID, they have expanded that even further. Um, but it means that when that ends on April 1st, uh, 15 million people up to uh, will be kicked off, right? So they'll have to go back out into the market. Um, you know, who cares? Uh, they will say. Um, this is being treated as a big victory, similar to Freedom Day here. Um, you know, finally, we can stop caring about other people. Uh, well, we can formally stop caring about other people. Um, so what can we do? So everything uh, Tony said, um, yeah, join, join save NHS, do, do all the good things, um, take action. Uh, we have some actions as well in COVID action. I'm putting on my COVID action hat instead of my American hat. Uh, they are the same hat. Um, take actions with us. Uh, you can go to our website, uh, see some great stuff to do. There's letter campaigns. There's things you can sign. There's um, posters you can download. Um, number two, you know, fight to improve what are called the social determinants of health. So that's a, a, a lengthy topic uh, to, to drop on my last slide. But um, basically it's the idea that health is not just a thing you see at the doctor, right? It's 
everything that determines your health outcomes. So your housing, your heating, poverty, food, education, everything we are, are, are always talking about already with the cost of living crisis. And, um, you know, this, this all links in to determine good health outcomes, right? Um, and so, you know, any, anything you can do to improve those things, whether it's, you know, doing like power activism or worker stuff or, you know, I don't know, whatever, take, take your pick is, is part of this. Number three, yeah, support health worker strikes. Um, yeah, we got to stand by the workers out there on the front lines. Um, if you really want to learn some more about the American healthcare system and how much it sucks, uh, I really recommend Tim Faust's book, Health Justice Now. It really radicalized me. It, I, I already was for universal healthcare, but it really explained to me exactly why it was that important. Um, Death Panel Podcast, uh, which is extremely good. They have a really good article about the May 11th thing that I can share. Um, and then Libby Watson is a journalist. She's British, but she lived in America. Uh, and she no longer writes it, but she had a thing called Sick Note that was a um, truly tremendous collection of healthcare stories in the U.S. Um, yeah, I really recommend checking that out. And of course, follow us, COVID Action Hat, on uh, social media. So COVID Action UK everywhere. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, solidarity, and as they say on the Death Panel podcast, solidarity and stay alive another week. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that note. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. And there a lot, a lot of new information, certainly for me. I thought it was absolutely fascinating and depressing as well, of course, you know, and terrible. But yeah, but very, very interesting indeed. Um, okay, let's um, open it up to...